of Psalm 136. But then we're going to focus on just a few verses. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him alone who to him who alone does mighty miracles. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who made the heavens so skillfully. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who placed the earth among the waters. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who made the heavenly lights. His faithful love endures forever. To the sun, the sun to rule the day, his faithful love endures forever. And the moon and the stars to rule the night, his faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who killed the firstborn of Egypt, his faithful love endures forever. He brought Israel out of Egypt, his faithful love endures forever. He acted with a strong hand and a powerful arm, his faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who parted the Red Sea, his faithful love endures forever. He led Israel safely through. His faithful love endures forever. Are you starting to see a theme begin to emerge here? Uh, but he hurled Pharaoh and his army into the Red Sea. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who led his people through the wilderness. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who struck down mighty kings. His faithful love endures forever. He killed powerful kings. His faithful love endures forever. Sion, the king of the Amorites, his faithful love endures forever. And Og, a king of Bashan, his faithful love endures forever. God gave the land of these kings as an inheritance. His faithful love endures forever. A special possession to his servant Israel. His faithful love endures forever. He remembered us in our weakness. His faithful love endures forever. He saved us from our enemies. His faithful love endures forever. He gives food to every living thing. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven. His faithful love endures forever. So, every year at Thanksgiving, we focus on some things. We are reminded that we have much to be thankful for. And there is a great and appropriate emphasis during the time of Thanksgiving on, on our personal blessings such as family and health and, and the comfortable lives which we live in comparison with most other people in the world. And it's always quite sobering to think of what our life might be like had we been born in another place and in another time. And it's good to, to always give thanks to the Lord for these material blessings. However, we must go beyond that. God is the giver of every good and perfect gift. We owe God everything. Our lives, every breath we have is a gift. Every pleasure we enjoy is a gift. Every satisfaction we derive is a gift. The majesty and beauty of creation is a gift. It, from the, it's the love of the Lord, of God of creation given to us. And this morning we want to focus on a blessing that is often overlooked, yet it is the blessing that is foundational to every other blessing and joy that we know. This morning I want us to let the Word of God remind us to give thanks for the character of God. Now, this psalm was most likely originally set up as a song to be sung. It's known as part of the great Hallel, the singing which was a regular part of the observance of the Jewish Passover and New Year's celebration. It's believed that this psalm was also part of the daily worship celebration. And in those first three verses, we see the specifics of what we are to first and foremost praise and thank God for. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Give thanks to the Lord, the God of gods. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His faithful love endures forever. Now the first thing we notice is, is the godness of God. Look at the way David begins each of these three verses. Give thanks to the Lord. Give thanks to the God of gods. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. David's not suggesting that, that we give thanks to some undefined spiritual being that makes us feel safe and secure and happy. He is not advocating that we thank a spirit guide or spiritual presence or be grateful to some God concept. 
David urges us to give thanks to the one and only true and supreme God. In 1 Corinthians 8, the Apostle Paul writes this, We all know that an idol is not really a god, and there is only one god. There may also be called so-called gods, both in heaven and earth, and some people actually worship many gods and many lords. But both of those is a little g and a little l. But for us, there is one God, the Father, by whom all things were created and for whom we live. And there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things were created, and through him we live. Our thanks should be to the one and true living God. He is the God who made, the God who sustains, the God who rules all things. He is our only king, and our praise and our thanks are to be focused on God alone. The God we thank is the one before whom everyone must bow, regardless of their religion, race, or nationality. This is the God who has revealed himself both in nature and through his divine inspired word and through the life and ministry and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There are many voices of religion that cry out to us in this world today. If you were a private in the military and you were given conflicting orders from a host of, of officers at one time, which one are you going to obey? The highest ranking Officer that gives you an order you follow. In the same way, there are lots of religious voices, lots of things calling out to us in this world. We are to listen to the voice of the one and true and supreme living God alone. Give thanks to him. And the second thing we notice from David is that we are to give thanks to the Lord because he is good. Now, we throw that word around a lot in the world, uh, in, in our lives. Mm, this chicken is good. This is a good day. That's a good song. That's a good kid. Now, we need to really think about that phrase, God is good, what it means. First, it means that God is not bad. God is not evil. God is good and not evil. We all know that there are things in this world that are bad. Anybody seen anything bad this week? Anybody encounter anything evil this week? Absolutely. Every day we come across it. God is good in the sense that, that God's character is pure and holy and, well, good. Good. God is not stained by evil. God's motives are not corrupt. God is not double-minded, not two-faced. God does not compromise his character. And God never gives in to that which is evil. One of the things that we as Christians must be is good. We must be people who are good and who are consistent in our goodness. What does that look like? Well, we must be people who are people of character no matter what circumstance. We must be honest when we're given too much change back and when we're shortchanged. We must be the same people when we are alone and when others are watching. We must be the same people in our homes that we are in our church, the same people at work as we are at church. We must be consistent in our goodness. We must be people who, who speak kindly of others in their face and behind their backs. In short, we are to be good people who are consistent in our goodness. God is perfectly consistent. The Bible says there is no shadow of turning with him. There is not even a hint that God will compromise with what is bad, what is evil. God will not go back on his promise. God will not abandon those that he loves. And secondly, God is good in the sense that he is competent. Now, if you are an employer, you have a good employee, that means that you have a person that works well, one that does their job, one you can rely on, one that grasps ideas, one that's a team player, one that, that gets it and lives it. When we talk about God being good, we mean that he is competent. He alone is the one who rules with wisdom and excellence. And I, for one, am grateful that God has a plan and that I don't have to to rely to my own devices, God has a plan, and he is competent to carry that out. In the confusing times of life, it's comforting to know that God knows what he's doing. He has a purpose for the things that he allows to come into our lives. Sometimes he's teaching us, sometimes disciplining us, sometimes building character or teaching us something that we're going to need to know in the future. Sometimes God is working in our midst to give us opportunities for ministry and to witness to his 
his power and majesty and love to those people around us. The point is this. God has a plan. God exercises his role as the ruler of the universe with wisdom and with skill and with confidence. God is good rather than unpleasant. God cares. He cares about our lives. If he cares about the sparrows, how much more does he care about his children? God notices the things that are going on, and he will never leave us nor forsake us. The third reason we give thanks to God, and it's actually the focal point of the, the passage because it's in every verse, his faithful love endures forever. It's repeated 26 times in this psalm. That probably means that it's important. Other translation says his love endureth forever, or his mercy endureth forever. But the New Living Translation says his faithful love endures forever. They're all saying the same thing. So let's, let's try to understand this phrase, his faithful love endures forever, just a little more fully. First, God's love is not fickle like much of the world that we encounter today. In life, we have fair-weather friends. In sports, we have fair-weather fans. People who cheer us on and support us when things are going well, but abandon us at the first sign of struggle. In reality, sadly, much of the world is this way. People are nice to us when they want something. They express love when things are, are well and pleasant. They're our friends as long as we agree with them. And the moment a circumstance changes, their feelings toward us change. We even see this in, in, in preschoolers and kindergartners. One day a child is included with a group, and they come home, everything is good, they're happy, they're joyful, and their life is good. The next day they come home in tears because they're no longer a part of that. They're no longer wanted. They've been ridiculed, made fun of, whatever. These, those who were friends yesterday turn fickle, and today they don't resemble anything good or loving. It happens in life so many ways and so many times that, that often we tend to project this kind of love onto God. What a mistake that is. Every day we get out of bed in the morning, we can be sure of one thing. We have great cause to thank God because God still loves us. No matter what yesterday brought, when we get up today, God still loves me. God still loves you, no matter what. Second, God's love is certain in hard times. Now, I don't mean to imply that God is not distressed by some of the things that he sees us do. Like a good parent, God does not agree with all of our choices. He doesn't like the thoughts that come through our mind, the words that come out of our mind. Sometimes he hates the things that we do. But that does not mean that he stops loving us. Many people through the years have confided in me <coughs> that when they have been in the most difficult circumstances of their lives, they have been abandoned by family and friends. They have relayed to me the unfortunate truth that, that they didn't really know who their friends were until they went through a time of, of sickness or a divorce or a conviction or a rehab or an unplanned pregnancy or a financial disaster. Unfortunately, we find in these times that some of the people that we have thought all along were our friends are quick to turn their backs on us. Yet at the same time, the most, most of the time, there are others who have stood in the shadows that we thought might have been on the edge that step in and lift us up. And I want you to know and understand today that even if every person in your life has abandoned you, you can still count on God. You can still count on God. God's going to be there to pick you up when you fall and to rejoice with you when you succeed because God is committed to you. How committed is God to you? He sent His Son to die for you. Even though we are fickle and our faith runs hot sometimes, runs cold sometimes, even though the world changes, God's love is constant. As the psalmist says, his faithful love endures forever. And then God's love gives us true security, which leads to abiding joy. It's a wonderful thing to experience an unconditional kind of love. It's, it's what every person longs for, yet so many do not find. 
And I just want to say, if there is a lack of joy in your life, then there is probably something lacking in your relationship with God. Because when you feel secure in your relationship with God, things change. You stop looking over your shoulder, waiting for the bad things in your life to catch up with you. You no longer have to be afraid of failure. You know one of the biggest reasons why Christians don't do greater things for God? Fear. We are afraid. Do you know why we fail to reach many of the dreams that we have when we're younger? When we find ourselves getting older, we haven't reached it. It's because we have been afraid. We're afraid that if we fail, that people, maybe even God, will no longer love us. That they'll think less of us and shy away and turn from us. So we play it safe. When we understand the security of God's love, we don't have to be afraid of such things. His love is secure. You'll stop beating yourself up over the past. You come to believe that God means it when he says, if we surely confess our sin, he'll forgive. And when God forgives, that issue is done. It's closed. The past is no longer a factor. It has been dealt with. You can let it go and you can move on. As we learn to rest in God's love, we find that our life is no longer characterized by extreme highs and extreme lows. Instead, there is a constancy of joy that's anchored to the security of God's love. We know and understand that God's faithful love endures forever and that God really is working all things together for his good and his good is ultimately what is best for us. So let's draw some practical conclusions. First, since God is good and God is everlasting in his love and God is merciful, we should be grateful to him on a daily basis, not just once a year at Thanksgiving. I think sometimes it's a little embarrassing that we have to set aside a time to be thankful. Now, we, I know the history of what Thanksgiving and how it came to be, but we as Christians, folks, we've got to be thankful and praise God every day for what he has done, for what he continues to do. Every day is a blessing with, with, with good things from God. He, he, his good presence, his abiding mercy and grace. All of our enjoyments are because of him. We have become so accustomed to God's goodness that often we take it for granted. Where would you be today if it were not for God's mercy and his grace? Where would you be without his faithful, enduring love? Second, since God is good, loving, and merciful, we should run to him and hide ourselves in him for eternity. Since God loves us and has made provision for our sin through Christ, it only makes sense that we would turn to him for that new life, that new abundancy of life that he promises. Why would you resist the one who loves you in such a way? Why would you put off a true and living and growing and vital relationship with a God that cares so deeply about you? Why would you entrust yourself to the fickle ways of, of other people? when you could trust the one who is consistent, good, and loving. Sadly, many Christians are playing with God. They're playing in their relationship with the Lord. And I encourage you to consider, if that's you, to consider what you're doing. You're keeping the one who loves you with an everlasting, enduring, faithful love at arm's length. You're toying with God. How can you tell if your relationship with God through Jesus Christ is genuine? Well, if you're honest with yourself, you probably already know the answer to that. But if not, examine your life for fruit. In Galatians, we see that the fruit of a vital relationship with Christ are things like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If you don't possess these things in your life and your relationship with the Lord, then there's a good chance that you are deceiving yourself. And if you are, then you need to stop. You need to come to the Lord. You're delaying the joy and the life that comes from that true relationship with God. Third, since God is good, loving, and merciful, we should discover a new motivation to share him with other folks. I'm afraid that most Christians have made their faith a very private matter. And it's not a secret. I've read you statistics before and surveys and all these things. Most professing Christians go through their lives 
He never wants to share the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ with someone who is lost. We talk about it with each other, with other believers. And that's good. But that's not where it's needed most. If God is good, and he is, and merciful and loving, and he is, then why wouldn't we want the world to know that, to have that? It's almost sometimes as if we, we're afraid that if sharing his love with others is going to diminish his love for us. Or sometimes it's like we're ashamed or embarrassed by him like a child is sometimes embarrassed by their parents. Or even worse sometimes, it seems like we just don't care about other people at all. <clears throat> and sometimes we're concerned that we might not share the message correctly. Listen, I don't know about you, but if I was drowning, I don't care if it's a certified lifeguard that throws me a life preserver or not. I don't care if they even know how to swim. Just help me. Fourth, since God's good and loving and merciful, we should find new courage for the difficult times of life. Perhaps you're going through something really hard. If you are, you're like most people. You feel desperately alone at that time. Sometimes it feels like the whole world is rushing by you and that no one seems to notice the burden that weighs you down. You feel like a person who was injured on the side of the road and there is no more good Samaritans to come and help. It can be a very painful time. <clears throat> what I want you to see this morning is the fact that you're never alone. You are not forgotten. You are not without the help that you so long for. God loves you. God knows you. God will help you, strengthen you to overcome, to endure, and to heal. God's not forgotten you in the past, and he won't forget you in your trials even if you feel like everyone else does. So put your confidence, put your trust in the Lord, in His goodness and love, and praise and thank Him regardless of the circumstances. And lastly, if God is good, loving, and merciful, we should strive to be that way as well. We should strive for a purity of life because we know that it's best and it pleases God. Charles Spurgeon wrote, he bears with sinners, surely we may. Especially this ought to be so with our relatives and children. A mother's love must never burn out, and a father's patience never expire. Hope for the most hopeless. Till they are in hell, pray for them. Till they are in their graves, hope for them. Till they die, labor to bring them to Christ. God's mercy ever endures. Let our tenderness endure. I don't know about you, but well, I do know about you. We all have those folks in our lives who are not right with the Lord. That's got to burden us hard. We can't wait for somebody else to do it. I don't want my loved one to die and go to hell. I don't want my friend. So this year, I encourage you to be thankful early. It's going to be a busy week. I was sharing with some folks earlier that we're going to have a house full on Thursday. And it's going to be stressful. It's the first holiday that family gathers that there will be an empty seat. Two empty seats this year. We need the peace of Christ to pervade our home. Our circle of friends. And our church. So I encourage you to begin Thanksgiving early. Don't wait till Thursday to give thanks because Thursday is going to be a stressful 
and jam packed and fast paced day. Start today. Make gratitude a part of your daily life. Instead of always complaining to God, and we do, if we're honest, boy, do we, we complain to God. Make it a point to look around and try and recognize and notice the daily blessing. Be grateful for what you have been given in gratitude. Take time to think about the character and attributes of God and learn to recognize that these are the things that have the greatest blessings <coughs> in our lives. I also encourage you to look for ways, subtle and not so subtle, to share the message of hope and salvation with those people that are going to sit at your table on Thursday. Those family members that, that, oh, they might say that they love the Lord, but they don't have any of that fruit in their life. Be bold and share the message of hope and salvation with, with those folks. Let others know what your basis for giving thanks is, where it originates. Show love for others by boldly sharing with them the truth of God's grace and mercy and, and faithful, enduring love. And as you share with others, know that there is a very real possibility that the person that you are sharing that love with just might be changed eternally. And isn't that what we're supposed to do as disciples? They will have a greater blessing to give thanks for this holiday. Maybe they'll have a calls to enjoy Enjoy and celebrate Christmas in a whole new life. And in the process, you will be showing your love and gratitude and thanksgiving to God in a way that extends beyond just saying grace at your meal. Give thanks to God, for He is good. He is the God of gods. He is the Lord of lords. And His faithful love endures forever. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing our closing.